Do I meant to move these over? Or they're going to pick me up. Yes. Yeah. They're all right. Hi, everyone. Um, I think we're going to start now. So, welcome to the Mansion House, um, our former home of John Gormley, who I'm sure will know a lot more about it than I do because I do not live here. Um, the mayor herself, the Lord Mayor, is away in EU business, and she sends her apologies for that. Um, but I am delighted to be here um, at this Rethinking Your Energy Demand document. I don't know if it's a launch or if it's just an actual launch. launch. Brilliant. Uh, delighted to be here. And so it's the right time for a document like this. Um, I'm not going to describe what type of crisis we're in. We already know there's an energy crisis, a biodiversity crisis, a climate change crisis. And the most important thing is like we cannot settle for just surviving these crises. We need to seize these opportunities and to create a cleaner, greener, and safer community, safer world, and safer planet. We need to thrive in spite of the crisis that we're in, and energy is absolutely pivotal where we can actually do this. And um, the Greens themselves, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the Greens. The Greens themselves, since they entered government in 2020, have been seizing the opportunity. The people of Ireland have actually provided us, and we've grabbed that opportunity with two hands. And um, we are at the center of the green energy revolution. And just to give you some examples of how um, the Greens and the government and Minister Ryan is really pushing that uh, clean energy revolution. We have the biggest home insulation scheme was offered under this government. And we know that that reduces obviously um, people's economic costs and um, it helps with the energy crisis. It also obviously helps long-term with the climate crisis as well. We provided grants for businesses, for schools, and for homes to revolutionize their rooftops with different types of solar panels. We've accelerated active travel programs to the likes of the Pathfinder program, to Bus Connects, also providing funding for numerous county councils out there to accelerate their own active travel plans. And um, we're electrifying our fleet. Uh, fleet. We've just bought 120 new LM, double, uh, electric buses as well. Um, so there's lots and there's plenty, and I'm not going into too much detail, but there's plenty that the Greens themselves are doing within this to try and really seize this opportunity. Clean energy independence, our core objective of the Greens. We've set a target of 80% renewable e electricity by 2030, and offshore wind is vital to that. And just last month, we had ministers from the North Seas over to sign a huge major um, EU wind deal, offshore wind deal. Um, as well as that, it's not just about energy, as Tommy Simpson has ensured that I also bring in something else as well. We've been doing plenty around with Malcolm Noonan around the biodiversity crisis. We've provided lots of funding um, around the climate. Oh, I'm here myself. Sorry. Yeah, you're all right. <laughs> the, cli uh, the climate fund as well provides lots of funding for different communities and businesses and councils themselves to do their own, to take that initiative themselves and progress climate um, programs within their own community. Uh, as I said as well, DCC are doing a lot, um, and I know within my own area of Cabergrass Nevin, we have two um, SECs, uh, they're providing workshops and they're beginning to tell people themselves and how they can save energy within their home, and um, they've provided active travel um, initiatives within the area as well, and um, the council itself is ret retrofitting our social housing, and um, we have district heating projects in the work as well, and um, there's a huge rise as well that we've seen from people who are applying for the Climate Action Fund in different types of initiative and projects on the ground around the circular economy. So stuff around fast fashion, stuff around reusable cups. And it's absolutely wonderful to see this. And this is exactly what we need. And I know some of this is outlined in the document. Um, and just to kind of finish up, we're at a moment of real change here. You know, right now, energy is being used as a weapon. We know this. Um, but we have a real opportunity here to really secure our futures, to really ensure that we're never held ransom again, to make sure we move to clean energy. No one has ever tried to weaponize the sun. No one has ever tried to weaponize wind. And Ireland has a pivotal role to play in that. And that's why I think the contents of this paper itself is so important, as it outlines, outlines how we can drive this change and seize this chance, ensuring hopefully that something positive comes from this crisis. Um, I really am sad that I can't stay here myself. Um, I have to go to Leinster House to Minister Ryan himself. Um, but hopefully I'll be able to drop in later. And I hope you have a wonderful time here. And I hope you really come out to Leon and something really beneficial comes from this. And thank you to everyone who wrote this paper. I'm sorry I didn't get the names, but thank you for putting investing into this.
and welcome again to Mountain House in Dublin. Well, thank you very much, Darcy, for that warm welcome. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Lord Mayor Caroline Conroy uh, for facilitating um, this beautiful venue here for this so such important topic. Um, Green Foundation Ireland has worked for the last 10 years, we're coming up to our 10th anniversary, on the linked crisis of uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, and now the circular economy, which we have, what we have come to call the circular economy, which we used to call dealing with waste, etc. And um, so we have, um, we're pleased to again collaborate with uh, Green, um, um, Green European Foundation, uh, who is our umbrella. We are a part of a global green family of um, edu to, to educate people in the important topics that I've just mentioned through, uh, throughout Europe. Uh, and and um, Cian Hasker from uh, Green, um, <laughs> what is it? Green European Foundation will talk to you shortly to tell you more about them. And um, I'd like to thank Tommy Simpson in particular uh, for working with uh, Jonathan and um, Peter Johnson Essex and Peter Sims over a long number of years. This is our third uh, major project with them uh, on these important topics, which, uh, as you will hear, we'll focus more on energy today. But we have done um, other linked work um, over the past number of years. So we're very, very glad to welcome them here again to Dublin today and to work again with Greenhouse uh, Think Tank UK. Um, we're also glad to see many old friends here and um, uh, new friends, hopefully. Um, so um, I'm really, I really just want to also to thank Davy, who has collaborated with it, this uh, us on this series of projects with uh, Peter and Jonathan over the last number of years, and to thank, of course, Anne O'Connor, and without whom, and if everything would collapse around us. Um, so I'm just going to leave it at that and um, please uh, welcome the uh, participants and I think I want to welcome particularly the online participants and I think CN is going to talk to you now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Can you hear me? So welcome the online participants. Uh, this is a blended event, so it's a little bit more complex than we're used to. So we have a number of online participants who'll be asking questions through Zoom, and we have the in-person uh, participants. I just want to give you a sense of the flow today of what we're gonna do, so you know where we're going. Uh, we're gonna start with an introduction to the Green European Foundation, um, which I'll introduce in a second. Then we're gonna have the paper that's been launched today, Rethinking Demand from the Greenhouse, and we have Peter and Jonathan who will be uh, giving us an insight introduction to that. We're gonna have a response, two responses, We'll start with a response from Saif O'Neill and then a response from Orla Kelly. Uh, and then we're opening up to responses from the online participants or the room. Now our challenge is if you have a response, if you have uh, a question or an insight to share, you have to come up here just the way it's set up, unfortunately. So once we've done that, we'll, we'll hear the responses, then we'll hand back over to the greenhouse just for their reflections on those responses. Uh, before we take a bit of a networking break. There's an opportunity uh, to get to know each other again or to, to look at where synergies might be across our sectors. And then we come back for the GFI panel, which is really looking at energy transitions, energy demand and the circular economy. So we start to introduce and go a bit wider into looking beyond just energy. And that panel uh, will be chaired by, um, by Michael Smith. Uh, he'll come in and chair that panel. And that panel will, will start with a presentation from John Gibbons and then go into uh, three short presentations from Claire Downey, um, from Rosalind Skillen and myself. Uh, and then uh, a little bit of a discussion and then uh, the minister, uh, junior minister, uh, uh, Oshin Smith, uh, will come in and look at circular economy and demand reduction. So we broaden it up a little. 
Um, after after Oshin, we'll take more reflections, questions from the floor and from the online participants. So use the question and answer function if you're on the Zoom on the webinar. Uh, and then we'll have a final reflection from Saif again, uh, trying to bring together the, the different comments, the different uh, contributions that have been made over, over today. And we'll close at 5.30 with the drinks reception. So that's our, our flow today, so you know where we're going. Uh, as as uh, was said, this is a Green Foundation Ireland and, green, and a Green European Foundation. And we have uh, Cian Hasker uh, from the Green European Foundation, who's just going to give a bit of an introduction to the climate emergency project that this project and other projects have been uh, done. Uh, Cian is the senior project lead at the Green European Foundation and Jeff's coordinator at Rethinking Demand. So I just need to, Cian, can we, can you? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can't see you properly. Just try again. All right. <laughs> Yes, I'm sad not to be there in person, especially now that I hear about the drinks reception, but um, it is really wonderful to, uh, to see you all in the room and online. Um, so yeah, hello from Brussels on behalf of the Green European Foundation. Um, we're very happy to be organizing today's event uh, together with Green Foundation Ireland and Greenhouse Think Tank. Um, and before we dive into all of the, the sessions that David just laid out, I just wanted to take a moment to highlight kind of the European wide debate that we are really trying to foster here. So Jeff as a European political foundation explicitly has as its mission um, to be a laboratory of ideas, uh, forward looking ideas, but also to build these cross border European debates on the big topics that define our time, the big challenges, the big opportunities. Um, so for us, the European project is very much about events like these happening all across Europe rather than, you know, top down technocratic debates in Brussels. Um, so I'm really excited to hear um, what, what comes out of today. Um, I mean, in this moment of multiple crises, um, I think thinking together as Europe is more important than ever, whether we're talking about COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, energy crisis, climate emergency, um, none of these challenges really have national level, you know, can, can only be addressed at the national level. They require collective buy-in and also a democratic conversation um, to take place. So that brings us to today, uh, to our topic of rethinking energy demand and the, and the project that this is all a part of. Um, I think when the project started um, at, well, early this year, um, together with our UK, Irish and Belgian partners, um, none of us could really have imagined that, you know, these, these conversations around energy sufficiency, large scale reduction plans in our consumption, and even topics like rationing um, and power cuts would suddenly be on, on the evening news. So the war in Ukraine um, was definitely a wake up call for many European countries that our ever growing demand for energy and materials carries certain risks for the environment, but also for the people, for our welfare. Um, so earlier today, we kicked off today's activities with uh, the report launch and a, a webinar on sufficiency policies for a post-growth world. Um, we had a panel of speakers from the UK, Belgium, Germany, Greece, France. Some of you might have attended online as well. Um, and we had participants from across Europe. And what I really took from it and what I also take from the report we launched today and hope will be reflected in some of the conversations and discussions um, is the importance for the green movement to be at the forefront of this conversation because these, these crises show that things like reducing energy demand will eventually have to happen one way or another. And even other groups and, and political families are starting to realize that. But we need to be at the forefront of those discussions precisely to ensure that they happen in a just, in a redistributive and in a democratic way. Um, so I wish you all an inspiring few hours. I'll be uh, following along online um, and do, yeah, read the report, uh, talk to the authors in the room um, and uh, hopefully stay in touch for, for further conversations across Europe on this uh, very important topic. So thank you, Davey. Thanks, Ian. Um... So it's fantastic to have um, Jonathan and Peter from the Greenhouse with us to launch this paper and to go into it. 
Uh, Jonathan Essex is a member of Greenhouse, a, a chartered engineer, an environmentalist, and he's been a councillor in Surrey, a green councillor uh, since 2010. Uh, Peter Sims is the chair of Greenhouse. Uh, his work started in Greenhouse, started with his involvement in climate jobs modeling project. And more recently, he's been coordinating the climate emergency economy program that you're gonna hear a bit more. So welcome Jonathan and Peter to launch this new piece of work. Thank you very much, Davey, for that introduction. So uh, I'm Peter Sims. Uh, I'm just going to take you through a bit of a tour of this report. We have paper copies at the back. So if you haven't already picked one up, there's paper copies at the back. It's also available to download online. Um, uh, there's a, the web links and all the details are on the back of the report. Um, so rethinking demand for energy. So this is rethinking demand in general, but this report specifically focuses on energy in the sense of uh, energy that we use day to day, not energy embedded in, in, in products, but energy that we use on a day to day basis, direct energy consumption. So um, this report has three authors, myself and Jonathan, and also Nadine, who presented at the online event in Brussels, but isn't here in Ireland today. Um, uh, I'm just going to give you a little overview of the, the project methodology and how we came to produce this report. Uh, and then we're going to take you on a little tour of some of the key findings and the, the key points within it. Um, and hopefully this will stimulate some interesting, interesting reflections from you, interesting questions, and we can uh, have a bit of a discussion around. Uh, so, as I said, this is a focus on direct energy demand, not wider resource use. We, you know, uh, we we had to limit the scope because it's you know it's there's a huge amount to engage with here, um, and we thought uh, it was really interesting to just focus on energy for now. Um, we've interviewed over the course of this project thirty leading academics and political. political um, you know, elected Greens and uh, candidates and various other people, and we've got a range of different views that fed into this, this um, piece of work. That led to us holding two roundtable discussions. The report is published today, um, and the foreword by, for this report is by Philip Lambert, who's an MEP in the Green European, in the European Parliament. Um, so that's sort of an over overview of how this report came to be. Um, I think it's important to give a bit of context about what we mean by rethinking demand for energy. So we're talking here about deliberately reducing the demand for energy. Uh, and we're talking about, therefore, changing the demand for energy services, not just changing how they're provided. So this isn't about you know, swapping one technology for another in order to deliver the same energy service. This is about rethinking how much energy, you know, what energy services we actually, actually matter to us, how important they are, what, you know, what we want to prioritize and what we actually need and what benefits our well-being. Um, and doing that requires yeah, engaging with two pieces of academic research that we've done for part of this. One of them's uh, called um, social practice theory, but it's basically about daily practices. It's around you know the way businesses and individuals go about their lives day to day. And the other one's about systems of provision. So this is the things that determine you know the things beyond our own control that determine what demand there is. So this is things like infrastructure, the layout of our public spaces, you know, what's available in terms of shops and services, um, the relative pricing of different things. All of these things come together to influence and, and shape what decisions we make about demand and what decisions companies make about demand. Um, so this is what we mean by rethinking demand for energy. We're going beyond just nudge and behavior change and uh, just tweaking, uh, you know, swapping one technology for another, which Jonathan's gonna come on to a bit later. So is rethinking demand is necessary. So uh, we, one of the things that we did as part of the research in this is we interviewed people from the University of Cambridge and they've recently published a report called Absolute Zero. Uh, and this report makes clear that um, you know, there is only a limited amount of renewable energy, sustainable energy available. You know, there is a limit to how fast you can build renewable energy. There's a limit to how much land we have. Um, there's a limit uh, around the resources and material stuff, which I'm sure will get picked up later in terms of the circular economy. Um, so we ultimately have a choice. We either uh, reduce demand for energy or we overshoot our carbon budget and risk going beyond 1.5 degrees. So, and the consequences that come with that. So, and I think it's important to frame uh, you know, the situation we're in as a choice. It's not a fate of complete. You know, if we do nothing effectively, business as usual, the status quo will continue. We have to, if we want to change direction, if we want to uh, limit climate change, we have to, we think, we pros and fraud, actively choose to rethink demand for energy. And this is a, a collective choice our society must make. 
And I think in a lot of senses, it's a choice that we haven't necessarily made yet. Um, so we, this almost means we have a choice between the status quo and disruption because rapid change to our ways of da our daily practices, to our the, the ways of business operating business practices, all of this will um, it will be disruptive in the short term. It has to, you know by definition change is disruptive. Um, so we have to make that choice, and we also feel, and this is one of the things we touch on in this report, is it's also a choice between redistribution. Um, it's a choice for redistribution because if we don't choose to redistribute the limited amount of energy that we will then have, uh, we don't think we think the inequality will become unacceptable, and certainly the inequality that we've already got will be baked in further. But you know, to get the political mandate, to get the public mandate and the public support for this sort of disruptive change, there has to be redistributive in nature. Um, so that's one of the points that we explore more in the report. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now, who's perhaps going to pick up a few more bits on this, and then he's going to take you through some of the the, the governance section of the report and then the policy section of the report, and then I'm going to come back at the end of the narrative. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I just want to touch on two things. Firstly, how we need to change the governance and that, then how we need to change the policies that respond to that and, and, and why in that order. Well, we started this research thinking it was the policies that needed to change, but increasingly we found that it's the wider governance that blocks the policy change that's needed. We, we found that many places that have declared a climate emergency, but it's not just about declaring it, it's about then transforming the action completely that follows. There's an opportunity now to address the cost of living crisis through redistribution of energy uh, resources in ways that frame and direct that emergency response to the climate science. We need to take that on now. It's a challenge for emergency governance changes now, not at some point in the future to be planned for. Well, and what would that look like? What would a change of governance look like that eliminated fossil fuel use globally? Um, how do we avoid those global oil companies and others uh, corrupting the roles of governments that, that, are, that need to enact the policies that we need to limit the demand for energy in the first place, as well as phasing out fossil fuel supply? And unless we do that, the chances are that renewable energy that we install will be in addition to, rather than instead of, the fossil fuel use we currently use globally. There's a strong motivation now, as we know, for a drastic reduction in demand um, that reduces our reliance on imports of Russian oil and gas, not just here, uh, not just across Europe, but across the world. And, and that really should mean that now is as important time as ever to radically rethink how much energy we use as a better way to improve energy security than securing energy security and somehow uh, in terms of reliance on on imports from elsewhere we need to deal with the cost of living and the energy crisis together um, that means we need to deal with excessive consumption alongside fuel poverty isolation alongside hypermobility jet setting lifestyles but but how do we do that what well firstly what came through on the interviews is we need to address um, the vested interest the fossil fuel companies uh, that sit behind the current government system and hold hostage our governments to their demands. We need to change that so that we have transparency that's essential for building trust, for politicians to be able to make the right decisions in all of our interests. So let's, let's, let's just step back from it and, and really accept that that is where politics is now. It's holding back the scale and the speed of change that's needed. We've got greenwash. Greenwash, I, I used to think was something that was the, uh, the, the hold of, of BP or, or Shell Oil Company claiming to have the future uh, all um, cleverly wrapped up in their advertising campaigns. But increasingly, it's also a tool of government that's papering over the cracks, uh, the chasms, if you like, between the talk and the action. And I'll just give you one example from the UK, uh, as, as that's what, what I, I know best. Uh, the, the UK government has just passed a new aviation policy. It's called Jet Zero. I imagine it maybe started as a ministerial joke of someone who likes to um, sit on have I got news for you um, because it rhymes with net zero. Um, but what it does is allow the aviation industry to have plans to expand every single airport in the UK and expand uh, the, the scale, the distance of freight and passengers around the world, uh, driving airport expansion there as well as here. Um, 
at the time when we should be acting on climate change with the promise that somehow the, some technical solutions will fly in or some biofuels will be grown elsewhere around the world to somehow buy us out of trouble later. And, and then we have this mythical idea of hydrogen and, uh, and electric planes, which really only will work on the short haul, which at best will cover something like three or four percent of the emissions of flight. So there's a growing integrity gap that's papered over. It needs to be addressed. We need an honesty. And that means we also need to move away from a financial focus of, of politics to, to have such as a Ministry of Investment, which was suggested to us, as a way to oversee and deliberate and arbitrate between government departments on climate grounds. We need to establish the state of emergency more like that we had within, in, in the COVID uh, pandemic that allows us to act and react quickly. We need to develop a real mandate to sustain that over a period of time, such as through direct direct democracy and real empowerment at the citizen level, because I think we really need to localise government and bring government such that it's held by and held to account by individual people. Next, I think on the side, we're talking about the, this idea of disruption. I think that's really, really important. We need to accept that rethinking energy demand means changing the status quo, um, not blindly hoping that renewable energy will some, somehow power a continuation of our current lifestyles our current scale of energy and material use. Uh, that's what the size of the economy is all about. That simply is not possible. We need to drastically reduce the scale of our material and energy use to deal with the climate and connected biodiversity emergencies. That requires change. And that means that the future is gonna be different. Disruption will be inherent, inherent um, but we can work through that, through things like a just transition to provide the security and the, and, and the new jobs we need across all the different sectors. We need to share the burdens, but it will mean that some businesses will decline, they'll need to shift, they'll need to pivot, and they've got currently their hands on our governments, and we need to, we need to address that. But crucially, disruption shouldn't just be about helping people through jobs, it should be about helping the most vulnerable to, to be supported through that change. Those with the greatest need, those in fuel poverty, and if we don't do that, it won't be a, just a failure of justice. It simply won't work. Just think of what happened to Macron when he proposed changes in um, fuel prices in France without any measures to address the inequality. The yellow vests came out. We need to take everyone with us. And that means we need to have a change of our current lifestyles. We need to plan support across our economy. We need, need governments to intervene in a planned approach to universal basic incomes, but really extending that to universal basic services that extend far beyond the NHS into transport, into energy, into other areas. That's the kind of future we, we, really, we really need. Um, and what does that mean? That means what really, we need to think about changes, not just in terms of individual sectors in transport, in energy and health and so on, but also across the whole economy. We need to shift from growth being the focus of our economy to post-growth being our accepted reality of where economics is. And that means we need to change the metrics, the objectives of our economy. And, and what happens if we move from a growthist approach to an acceptance that we are beyond that growth stage in, in the, the history of humanity? It means that to address the growing inequalities of today, we need to redistribute through the economics that we have. So a post-growth economics, we would argue, and it's come out so strongly in our interviews, I can't emphasize them up this, this enough. A post-growth economics is an economics of redistribution. And yeah, and, and that means we, we really need to overhaul our systems of governance. Everything needs to change. It isn't a question of somehow delivering on the climate emergency, reducing our scale of energy use by having a set of individual policies within our current governance systems, it won't work. We need to declare a state of emergency. We need to involve people far more actively participating, deliberating, holding our politicians to account, understanding and evaluating what works and really making sure we, we continue to evolve and adapt our politics going forward. So what do those policies mean? So. This slide comes directly out of uh, this year's IPCC uh, climate mitigation report. Chapter five, which is about changing demands within society, focuses on avoid, shift, improve as a policy framework to, to reduce the scale of energy use to address climate change across our society. Um, 
so, so why avoid shift improve well it, it's about it's like the energy equivalent of reduce reuse recycle if you like we need to avoid the need for energy in the first place before we shift to more efficient production and, and sorry more efficient consumption so that will be things like um, public transport it'll be about shared services rather than individual consumption so there's a cultural change there's a huge cultural change in the shift and then improve is is about um, using technologies to deal with what's left it's about renewable energy supply it might be electric vehicles but the status quo is very much focused on the improved stage it's all about electric vehicles solar panels and wind turbines that's what we hear from our politicians we don't so much hear about the need for the cultural shift we don't so much hear about the need to stop uh, our dash for growth our dash for ever more infrastructure and resource use in the first place so let me elaborate slightly more more on that so avoiding energy use um will mean will mean things like um th things like you know banning private jets it'll mean um, stopping airport expansion. It'll also mean reducing the amount of energy use in, in the home. Um, and what, one thing that struck me from, from the conversation with, with a leading sociologist is, you know, 18 to 21 degrees, the average temperature in, 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 in a house. Why is that? That's because that's the, the uh, des design temperature for comfort based on a, a male wearing a suit all year round indoors. Um, Sometimes people wear less in the summer, sometimes people wear more in the winter, and there's a much more diversity of people than, than that research suggests. But, but that is locked into building regulations that's been promulgated around the world. We need to address that demand. We need to challenge some of those embedded rules that get locked into what we think of as acceptable and, and, and normal. Um, shifting, I mean, I think the big shifts are, are things like public transport, it's about retrofitting all of our buildings. It's the cultural shift that you don't see in, in the energy security strategies of the UK, which solely focuses on, on, on energy supply. And what's the benefits also of this avoid and shift before improve? It means we can do it faster, avoid and shift to things. It's far quicker to change culture, believe it or not, than it is to build a wind turbine. And if you do those two first at scale and at speed, then the amount of renewable energy, the amount of technology investment, the amount of lithium and cobalt to be mined to go into batteries is one huge amount less. Um, let me move on. We need to join up policies. We need to think of packages of policies rather than individual policies. We need to bring together the, the enforcement sticks with the, the carrots of incentives. At an at a economic level, but we also need to link together supply and demand. So, for example, in, in the food sector, yes, we need to move away from an industrial agriculture at the consumption end, which can be about incentivizing uh, shifts in terms of what we buy. But at the same time, we need a just transition of agriculture to support it. We need to join up the supply with the demand. Um, and we'll find that in all of these policy areas, that there's a spectrum of policies you can have from the fairly soft. Uh, nudges all the way through to uh, progressive pricing and then rationing and then outright bans. What's acceptable at any moment in time in any sector is going to be different in any place. But what we found in our, our research was that participation, involvement of people in decision making will, will shift the bar as to what's acceptable in any one of those areas. So if we want rapid change, if we want transformational change, we need to bring people with us and we need to involve them actively in the decision-making pro, pro, process. And I think that's that's absolutely crucial. I, I think finally, what I'd like to say is, and I think it's really to emphasize a point that Peter made earlier on, is that involvement in participation is also about not just involving people to increase what's possible, but it's also to better inform government of the impacts of policies that's having and the need for these policies to be redistributive. I mean, universal basic services, shared public transport, that, that's going to require public sector investment and public leadership and stronger regulations to direct where we want private sector to go. Um, that's a really big ask uh, for policymakers of today. And that's why I think it, it is that transformation of governance, that participatory approach, that's moving the moving away of vested interest that I think is going to be the, the really big thing that we need to unblock to allow this kind of thing to happen. Back over to you, Peter. 
Thank you very much, Jonathan. Now, there's a lot to digest there. There's a lot of different things in terms of, you know, this, re this report tries to capture a br very broad range of different angles on rethinking demand for energy and, you know, give an overview to frame the whole debate. Um, so, uh, you know, Jonathan's talked about the governance challenge, the challenge that our current governance systems aren't up to scratch. And he's talked about um, the, the, you know, what the policies look like and what the interventions might look like and how they might need to fit together. Um, I'm now going to talk very briefly to wrap up about um, how we talk about this. What are the narratives? What's the role of narratives? What's the role of communication? How do we, you know, you know take this message forward? Um, and I think to start that, we need to step back a bit. We need to not go, so therefore I need to, you know, work out what the, the soundbite is to communicate this. We've got to step back a little bit because actually... If we're talking about changing culture, we've got to look at what influences culture as a whole. It's not just about you know, what we message from our organization or any other organization or political party or otherwise. Um, what influences culture, what influences values, what influences the way we people understand the world is a huge range of things from advertising to, to you know, even the layout of, you know, of, of um, the way services are provided has all sorts of influences on how people understand the world and how people process things. So, Rather than looking at narratives from the, this specific narrative here, we have to look at the, the narratives overall that are portrayed and per permeated and propagated by society. And you know that might mean things restricting certain vested interests and um, incumbent industries' ability to influence cultural narratives, do things like advertising, as well as uh, making space for alternative narratives and, and crafting alternative narratives. Um, so. I think the other it's also important to recognize the limitations of messaging. You know, we if you think in terms of you know COVID and you know a lot of governments had you know uh, public information campaigns, which often brought people think about in terms of well, how can we get communicate all this rethinking demand messaging? Well, maybe we need public information campaigns. But there's a real limit to what you can do with public information campaigns. And there was some re there's some academic research about that that's um, referenced in the report to do with too often um public information or any sort of top-down one-way messaging focuses on the what, the instructions, and glosses over the why. It's much harder to, to build understanding and comprehension around the why we need to do things and why is rethinking demand important and what are the, the dynamics of that choice we have to make through one-way messaging. And this, again, comes back to that point that this has to be a collective choice. You know, even if not everyone can be involved in every part of it, there has to, we have to build a sense of agency. We have to build a sense of control, a sense of people, um, you know, have some agency to shape what this looks like, and that we all have some degree be part of a collective choice. And that requires looking at these deliberative forms of democracy. So why matters not just what, um, and we also have to stop this tendency to sort of, well, because we've got to get it through in a one-way soundbite, we've got to simplify all of this complexity of a you know thirty-six page report down to you know. Uh, Two sentence soundbite. And um, unfortunately, we, you know, that just obscures it. It means that we will never really get to grips with the, the real debate that needs to happen. So we have to trust people with the reality and the complexity. And we have to, uh, you know, not shy away from having those difficult conversations. Um, so there's a role for deliberation. Uh, so, um, the report, as well as having that sort of general conversation about what the role of narratives is, it also, um, you know, it does say, so, you know, here are some things where we need to build consistent narratives. So we need to have a consistent narrative that what we are aiming for is perhaps well-being for all, you know, energy security for all. It's not economic growth. That might be a means. It might not be a means. The economy is a tool. It's not a, a destination in its own right. We maybe need to have consistent messages about what humanity's place in the world, you know, that we are interdependent with other life on Earth, with uh planetary systems and, and that we have an intergenerational dependency as well um and we have to convey and reinforce values like empathy and honesty and we you know we if we're going to take that redistributive approach jonathan uh, mentioned we need to you know proactively be thinking about well what's the impact of xyz intervention on this community and that community and therefore how can we mitigate against that how can we you know build into the proposals ways of compensating, ways of both, you know, redistribution isn't just economic, it's also, for instance, um, universal basic energy allowances to sure if energy prices go up, everyone can afford their basic energy needs, things like this. Um, so narratives need to be differentiated as well as them being, need to be consistency in some areas, they also 
need to be differentiated in some sense. They need to be sensitive to different cultural areas and different geographic areas, and they need to evolve with time. There's no, you know, here's the five narratives that are going to communicate all of this to every audience in Europe. That just doesn't exist. We don't, you know, we we have to accept that there's a degree of complexity there and work with that. Um, so I'm going to end with this quote from the report. Uh, there's no time left. We need a metamorphosis, not a transition or a transformation. We need to change everything. And I think that brings to mind a number of key points. And the, the one that stands out for me is this idea that we can't possibly know what the end result's going to look like, what the, not the destination we're going for until we've started. The, the change that we're is it's going to be required in order to think rethink energy demand you know if we're going to make that choice to rethink energy demand and limit global temperature rise rather than pursue the status quo we're going to have to have a leap of faith almost we're going to have to make some decisions and head in a certain direction and we won't know exactly what the the society we're going to create is going to look like until we've got there um and we just have to accept that um and we have to you know perhaps talk about that too so um thank you very much david i will hand back to you and I'll just go back to the beginning for. Excellent stuff. Uh, thank you, Jonathan and Peter, the greenhouse over in the UK. So we're going to have a number of Irish responses, then an opportunity to uh, take responses from our online participants and on the floor. As I mentioned, we have a constraint where you, you'll have to come up and make your comment, reflection or ask a question. So we're gonna have uh, two responses and then we're gonna hear these other questions of response, then bring back the greenhouse before we go to a break. So our first responder is Saiv O'Neill. Uh, Saiv is an assistant professor at DCU, School of Law and Governance in Climate Change Policy and Politics. Saiv, your response, please. Um, thank you so much, Davey. Um, which way? You have to stand, back, I have to stand here. This is where the online Um, Thanks very much, Davy, and for the organizers for inviting me. It's a, a real honor to be back here in the Mansion House after some time and um, to be with you to talk about what is a really important contribution to a debate we're not having, happen, having actually uh, in practice. Um, so, just to put a little bit of Irish focus on it, our per capita CO2 emissions are about 7.11 uh, tonnes of carbon dioxide uh, per person per year. And if you add in other greenhouse gases, that rises to about 13 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. And we know that the planetary fair share um, of the global greenhouse gas budget, specifically the carbon dioxide budget, is something like 1.6. So we are way overshooting uh, what is our fair share of a very finite and shrinking resource. We would need at least 2.8 planets if everybody consumed natural resources at the rate that we do in Ireland. Now, people might say, well, it's not individuals or households that are doing all this consumption, but it as a proxy for what's happening in the economy, it's important to have, you know, rough figures like that to work with. So one of the points I would make just in relation to the report is that when we talk about energy demand, we do actually need to be quite numerically literate about it because it's the numbers that matter. The numbers are telling us what the threshold is, what the barriers, what the potential are. So we do need to kind of start to quantify what's possible and what we ought to be doing, and as well as obviously measuring and monitoring where we're at. And that, of course, takes you away from the conversation at the moment in Irish policy, which is very much about percentages, uh, relative reductions, percentages of renewable uh, penetration into the system, for example, don't address the overall uh, issue of energy demand that's continually growing, and it's expected to continue to grow right out to 2030 complicated by the fact that not only is the Irish economy growing, but the population is growing as well. And so, you know, household formation, all those kind of basic ingredients add to energy demand, and it's, it's, it's a complex process. So I think any serious political program um, for degrowth, for managing energy demand for an Irish context really needs to grapple with the numbers, because that's the starting point from which we can backcast and look at the kind of scenarios uh, that might work and the different kind of policy instruments that might work. 
so the other thing I wanted to say was that degrowth is not necessarily the only thing this report wants to talk about. And it's a great piece of work, by the way. Thank you so much. But it's important that we point to some issues with it because it's it's, it, it's actually a cluster of lots of different things. On the one hand, it's a kind of a causal or positive theory about the way the economy works, but it's also a theory about the way the economy ought to work. So a kind of a normative program of the way things should be. But there's also a third dimension to it, which is kind of, I'm gonna call it rhetorical, but I don't mean it in a dismissive way. I mean it in the kind of way that it might enter into political discourse as a kind of narrative, just as you were telling us, uh, Peter. And I don't mean it dismissively at all, but the reason I'm, I'm, I'm identifying that third strand is because <laughs> for preparing today, I had a look at the Oireachtas website and I did a search. Now the Oireachtas website uh, archives go back a few decades and there were just three entries for the word degrowth. Two of them are from this year, one from Senator Roisin Garvey, Green Party Senator, who was talking about it in the context of the Circular Economy Bill. The second was a very interesting contribution by also Green uh, TD Mark O'Cohasey in relation to the sick leave bill, which was all around working time and workers' rights. So he was interested in raising the issue uh, with uh, the, the minister, the relevant minister, in the context of four-day working week and the kind of shift to automation and the implications for, uh, for work. So the third entry is from 2019, previous Doyle, and it was another TD entirely from a very left-wing party. And interestingly, Joan Collins, the TD in question, really advanced the concept. She put it right out there in the context of the kind of whole economic system needing to change, to adapt to climate change, to kind of uh, redistribute wealth resources and to kind of uh, address all of the problems that you've identified. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because she explicitly adopted it as a socialist ideal. And the challenge for you as Greens of various hues <laughs> is to try to find a way of explaining to the public um, what this concept is and what sort of concept it is. Is it a socialist idea? I mean, you might say, oh God, that's just so irritating to be always dragged back into that kind of spectrum. But in terms of public opinion, I don't think it's going to be enough to just entice people with citizens' assemblies and participatory democracy. We need a much more uh, sophisticated level of political discourse from the top. And unfortunately, even for a small political party like the Greens, it falls to the Greens to do the leading on these issues. And the question is, is anybody going to lead out the conversation in this way? Is it helpful to do it starting with a concept like degrowth? Or would it be better to look at scenarios for different sectors and say, right, let's talk energy, let's talk models, let's talk scenarios, let's do what, you know, do the framework but very sector specific, and then talk about the transport sector and other areas of energy demand, and of course, food systems slightly separately, package it in a way that isn't so daunting perhaps for the public. Um, and I, I'm not uh, being as, as prescriptive as I sound really, I haven't worked this out for myself. Because the reason I think is that there are a number of really significant elephants in the room here. There are really huge taboos around limiting personal freedoms, um, advertising. I mean, you address all these in the report, but translating that into a coherent political program, like how do you even start? Yes, we could do it with the advertising industry. We have the tobacco example behind us, which has worked. But there are also the kind of really uh, emerging constraints that we're going to have to address. The, the limitations on energy use, whether it, it's through pricing or through caps, through rationing, whatever, we have to somehow initiate this kind of conversation. It is entirely absent from political discussion. Um, and, you know, you know, I don't think well-being for all covers that ground. I don't think we are being honest enough with the public about the uh, risks associated with both our insecure energy situation and with climate change. The third point is that information to the public is not to be taken for granted. One of the reasons why there was a public acceptance of the COVID measures is that there was a bombardment of the public 
with scary information about the risks of this, that and the other and what you needed to do. There was no let up in the instructions we were given and they were updated and justified. But the interesting thing is they were also legitimized. Now you, you do raise the question of legitimacy in the report and the different types of mandates that are required for different times, types of measures. But the legitimacy critically that COVID told us worked, admittedly, we felt like we had no choice, was firstly parliamentary oversight. There was very, very deep scrutiny of all the measures that were taken. And secondly, everything had a sunset clause. And that if you're restricting people's rights in any way, civil liberties, that kind of sunset clause is very important. Otherwise, you're just giving the government sweeping powers to have police at every roundabout, which we wouldn't want in perpetuity. So I think when we're talking about participation and what's acceptable and what's feasible, we have to broaden the conversation past the whole deliberative democracy piece. Um, and I, I know that that's something Greens will feel comfortable with because you lead from the top anyway on this. And you know, but representative democracy is still very, very important for providing those kind of institutional checks and balances. And I think the rule of law and institutional mechanisms to address governance is also a really critical area. And so governance is, you know, like we have we have ways of making changes happen and building institutional mechanisms and regimes. We have some experience of doing this and we should work with what we know has worked. So apologies if I've gone on a bit long and look forward to any other questions later. So online participants, if you want to make a reflection or ask a question, if you can use the question and answer function. Um, everyone here, we're going to have a second Irish response uh, to the Greenhouse paper from Orla Kelly. Orla is Assistant Professor in Social Policy at the Department of Social Work and Social Justice at UCD. And our research areas include social dimensions of climate change, sustain sustainable human well-being and eco-social policies. Orla. Uh, OK, first of all, thank you very much um, to everyone for inviting me to be here. Um, it's such a great report. Um, so a couple of things, I'm just gonna pick up on uh, a couple of themes that I and in the report and relate them to some of the policy and research agenda that um, I'm involved in here in Ireland and um, that are happening more generally. Um, so firstly, in terms of the tone of the report, and I, I think this is reflective of how things are moving on the whole in terms of um, both national and international policy briefs um, and policy making, and that there's a real urgency, there's a shift in tone to be reflective, to acknowledge the appropriate urgency um, of our current situation. As um, Antonio Gutierrez said this just this year, delay is debt, and that is really where we are now. You know, we, the the time for delay and incremental change is is really is really past, as you summarise at the end of your report. Um, the the other kind of um, tone shift in the report that I I think is also reflective, and we see it in the IPCC report, is it's this reappropriation of the notion that we need to ch also change demand side policies. So. Um, there was right partly in response to the kind of appropriation of individual action by fossil fuel interests, you know, it was all about measuring our individual carbon footprint so that structural change wouldn't be necessary or happen. Even as a green movement or an environmental movement, there has been kind of a reluctance to take that back for fear of kind of playing into that narrative of, of incremental and individual change. But um, as was mentioned earlier, we see the shift in the latest IPCC report, and we see it in reports like this and others that actually individual action, collective, um, be it as a person, a community, or as a constituent demanding of our policymakers, must be coupled with this kind of policy making to, to have an opportunity structure that allows people to make decisions in relation to energy demand or, or others, um, the, the so-called provisioning systems that we need to allow agency in terms of energy use and other things. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, the second, the kind of three themes of the report governance, um, first of all, in terms of addressing vested interests, again, this is something that we're seeing much more, much more um, open and honest um, acknowledgement that 
where we, we are, where we are, not by accident, but because people who are benefiting from capital accumulation have stalled um, progress, have stalled policy making and have sown seeds of division within our society, thereby limiting the political mandate of those parties that would uh, make progress and make change. Um, so this kind of um, acknowledgement of, of vested interest, I, I really like and, and thought was great. Um, in terms of just a research project that we're doing here in Ireland at the moment, um, colleagues and I at, at Northeastern are looking at um, lobbying in the over the last 10 years by interest groups here and how what narratives they've used to really delay climate action by sowing seeds of um, division and doubt and how those have kind of fed inadvertently or otherwise into Irish media coverage, be it the Farmer's Journal or more mainstream um, coverage. Um, so I'm just kind of getting into these nitty gritty a little bit to kind of give you examples of um, how it is, how we can move forward from a research and policy making agenda to taking these big ideas of degrowth into um, actual actions. Um, the, the second part um, that in terms of narrative uh, or policy um, and this picking up on this movement towards sufficiency. Um, and, and I think I really like side points of this well-being for all is, is true and, and you know it's what we need to focus on. But what is that? You know, it's it's such a huge concept. Um, we do have a lot of work to, to do, and, and I think there's a lot of there is a lot of research happening um, in terms of demand side, what what it is, the numbers that side was talking about, what it is that is a good life, what is a decent provisioning system, what changes do the government need to do? Where's the baseline? You know, we're all familiar with this donut economics of this um, safe operating space for humanity. How do we reach a social floor where everybody has an equitable standard of living, but we're also not transgressing these planetary boundaries? And we're starting and a research agenda to get more into the nitty gritty in terms of numbers and policies that facilitate this change. Um, if there's also a redistribution piece. What, how do we redistribute um, energy and carbon throughout the world and within society? But there's a bigger question here too. Um, so I just finished research on a trial, a six month trial of reduced work times of 13 companies in Ireland. Um, results to come, another, another uh, report launched next month. Um, but the, the idea here is, is looking at, you know, how if we, if we frame the environmental question as an individual environmental loss and we allow the narrative to, to be positioned that environmental needs and um, meeting social needs are somehow oppositional as opposed to mutually constitutive, um, that's an issue. And reducing work time is one of those policies that has within this kind of broader post-growth policies and agenda that has the propensity to allow people to have this better standard of living in ways that isn't so ecologically intensive. Now, to, to get to another point of the report, this needs to be part of a unified social and ecological framework. If everybody is taking working four days a week and we're allowing Ryanair to offer flights for 10 euro, you know, we're going to have some problems. So, but it gets to the point that, you know, this needs to be a unified social and ecological. Um, so that's my final point, because I know everybody's probably dying for their break by now. Um, enjoy being the last speaker, but um, is, is to be conscious of our framing. And I think that um, this, Certainly, we need um, overarching changes to how we um, frame narratives and, and, and how people need to understand the urgency and the danger. Like what Sai was saying, you know, we were bombarded with messages about how, you know, the danger to our well-being that COVID was offering. But where is the equal urgency and consistent messaging when it comes to the climate crisis and where we are? So we absolutely need that. But we also need to be to, to kind of put out there that it's there are many double dividend wins out there, be it four day week or something else where we can have experience gains in human well-being in ways that are not ecologically intensive. Um, and, and finally, part of that kind of engagement and messaging is just like Sive and, and um, the authors of this report have, have laid out in detail that there's an engagement piece. Um, so we've got a, got a research project in UCD now at the moment with um, students to ask that we know that their levels of eco-anxiety and grief are, are, are going higher, like all of us. No, I don't think anybody who works in this sphere and, you know, has two eyes in their head can really 
um, feel okay about our trajectory. But um, in addition to asking them, you know, what it is, how are they feeling? What is the level of anxiety? How concerned are we about climate change? We know we're concerned. Um, but but it's also this, this kind of notion of, well, what can the university be doing? To, how can we reform our provisioning systems, be it in education or policymaking or whatever it is, to allow people to act, to have the agency to act in, you know, less energy demanding ways, this kind of reforming of our social um, institutions in ways that, that, that allow for individual agency to act in our self-interest, um, while also kind of laying out this bigger structural role for policymakers, be it in government or institutions like universities, to, to provide an opportunity system to, to bridge this, um, this gap between um, behavior and, and um, this gap between how people want to act and in, in less eco-intensive eco ways and um, being facilitated to do so. Um, so thank you for the report. It was great. It was really, uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks, Orla. It's, uh, we now have time for bringing the intelligence in the room. Uh, so if, if people want to indicate if they've got a question or they want to come up, so we have three or four. Um, we are going to have to come up to the podium to make this, so the online participants see us as well. Can I ask you to come up first then? You're, yeah. And online participants, there's a few of in the question and answer uh, function. I've asked some questions that I'll read out. So. Hi everyone, um, how great to be in a room, the oak room. The oak was the symbol of wisdom and strength and unity in ancient Ireland and under Parnell as well. Uh, my name is Brian McDonald. I'm a statistics advisor to the WHO on the COVID response. So if I may just take two or three minutes to answer a question you, you brought up there about how we can use COVID to, um, to engage communities, in the, if that's okay. So in the COVID response, the global response, it was like a grandfather clock, it was like 10 different, different circles connecting each other. The central one is uh, coordination and the second one is risk communication and community engagement. Uh, I was the statistics advisor on that one. So we, we have been thinking then about how we can use what we've learned on engaging communities in emergencies to, to, to climate change and we're, we're, we're developing a paper on it and I won't take too long to go through it now. Um, I think when we're looking at, um, at um, emergency responses, Ireland was very strong in risk communication, but we wouldn't see it as a model. Uh, the place that was really stands out as a model for me is Congo with the Ebola response. Ebola is a frightening disease. It's really good risk communication. People have been told what the story is, what's happening, what to do, but the communities lead. So everything, partly now because of the context, you know, it's Congo, there's, there's not, not a lot of facilities, but on so many things, like communities organize the funerals, which have to be done very carefully. They do the surveillance. They look after the people, you know. So the communities are actually leading the response. It's so impressive, you know. And of course, that provides the agency, you know. So I think like we do have a vision for that. Climate change is a is a crisis, you know. So and we think our, what we have can be applied broadly to uh, this climate crisis. Um, just so many things you're talking about is what we also are working on ourselves: behavior change, trust participation, community supports in, for engagement, and then risk communication. And you were mentioning as well, the infodemic, the greenwashing and so forth, how we deal with that, you know. Um, in, in there in Geneva, we wrote guidance during the crisis on uh, risk communication, community engagement, and it was all about the systems building. So we have actually now very detailed guidance for the first time on what we mean by each component of risk communication, community engagement systems. And uh, what we're trying to do now is look at how that can be applied to climate change. So um, I just go through things very, very quickly. And so much of this of it is already there, like we have it, but I think what we don't have, and what you've all been saying, you were saying as well, Sai, is just the sense that professional support communities lead, you know, it's about community leadership because we won't get there otherwise, you know, that's for sure. So things like participation with the Iris Convention, also the Dole, I think that, Sai, that's such a fundamental point. The Dole is the representative body. And direct democracy is a, is a, is a complement to that. Um, what are the supports that we need for communities for them to be able to act? You know, for all of us, myself as well, all of you, members of community, and then on risk communication. For instance, on infodemic and greenwashing, like what is the system we're going to put in place to deal with that? You know, what are the components? You know, we have to start talking technically. 
about these questions. Um, so like I said, I'm going to stop there. We're writing a paper on it at the moment. I have actually been in contact. I'm in the Green Party. And John, hello. Um, I'm in contact with um, our colleagues in the Green Party are very interested in the questions that Government of Ireland does have an interest in it. I can't say anything more than that. You know, it's just very early discussion. But also from a personal point of view, I would like to be in contact with you and I uh, ho hope maybe we can look at this paper together and uh, it'd be great to start detailing what, what the system is, you know. So that's it. Thanks very much. Yeah. It's wonderful to see the synergy and connections between different sectors and where the common interests are. Um, so there's a few more. Let's take a woman, if we can. So. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. You're looking at this camera here just to give the online participants. Fine, OK. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the authors on this report. It's incredibly important. It's a step in the right direction. It's what we all should be doing. We should be moving toward degrowth. I fully agree with what they put forward. What bothers me the most, and I'm a sociologist by training. My name is Glinda Chimino. What bothers me the most is that, as someone mentioned, the elephant in the room of limited free personal freedom, the other bigger elephant in the room, which is never dealt with, is war and the military. The amount of energy they use, the amount of resources they use, the amount of damage they do. and um, as an American living in Ireland 50 years by choice, um, I have, I'm very aware that the biggest influence in this whole area is the American military, which uses as much as if it was a country, it'd be using the 47th country in terms of energy use. But we have a vicious circle here because we know that climate change can cause wars through a competition for resources feeling ex existentially threatened by nuclear weapons can also cause wars. All these things are things we need to look at, but alternatively, wars cause climate change in a very, very big way. And we can't keep writing reports and producing reports in which we act as if that doesn't exist. If every single person in Ireland brought their usage down to 1.6, a fair share, it would not solve anything. We need a world solution to a world problem. It's not just the military, it's not just the wars, it's the aftermath of wars. It's the rebuilding, the use of concrete, the use of, it's the agricultural lands with mines on them and un unable to be used. Okay, I'll wind this up. We have, I believe at the moment, 220, to million people in over 53 countries and territories who are experiencing severe food insecurity. Many of these are in famine already. If you can imagine one mother watching her child die from starvation, multiply that by several millions and you'll see what we're ignoring in the world. I just want us to find a world solution to end war, eliminate nuclear weapons, and then this will be possible. Thank you. There's definitely a lot to do. So I'm gonna, as our next um, in-person speaker comes up, I'll just read out a couple of the questions for Peter and um, Jonathan. So Reinhard Huss uh, asks, should there be a shift from an economic to an ecological focus? It's the ecology stupid rather than the economy. Um, there's a few more, I'll just read them out, but yeah, okay. Hi. Can you stay at this here? side, please? Um, and this okay. is who you're looking at, as well as... Who okay. Hi. My name is Manuel Salazar. I'm from the Global South, but uh, also an Irish person. I've been uh, here for 17 years. And um, experience, you know, in South America, also how what oil, oil companies do, uh, that's, you know, over there. And um, one of the things that I've seen in all this uh, time is that uh, we are a species that are more reactive than we are proactive. And unfortunately, we deal with the situation is when it's an our you know, in our own steps. Uh, so the eight out of 10 people here in other things than climate change is not really a threat for them because they haven't, you know, suffered as it is. But it's very different when you go to Clontarf and you talk to people in Clontarf and they say, oh yeah, we got a problem because they, you know, have all these floods uh, all the time. So I suppose uh, one question that I would have for you guys because I read the model as the report is that if we have an example where we human beings have been proactively, you know, acting on to try to address a situation, where to, you know, obviously it's going to affect us at some point, but we don't see it anymore, right? So, um, um, the COVID situation, for example. So we all think then it was just a, uh, you know, sickness that comes to us at some point, but in reality, it was we human beings, you know, um, 
threaten wildlife, taking wildlife animals and bringing the disease to us. The cost of living, for example. So everything you think then is because, uh, uh, you know, the prices are rising, but it's our dependency on oil and gas that are, you know, uh, bringing those prices up because everything depends on the international markets. Uh, and the solution is to switch into renewables. So those connections over there with climate and the situations that we are suffering are just not there. So then we have somehow to be more proactive as a species actually to addressing those issues that are gonna be a problem in the future, but at the same time, make those connections that uh, we are suffering right now. And it's also linked to uh, climate change somehow. So it's basically a question and also, you know, you know lay down this question. Yeah. So I think um, anyone else in the room? Come on up, Kat. Um, so there's a couple other ones here. Uh, Paul Leach is asking, uh, Paul Leach is asking, discuss the ethos of flourishing in a green perennial economy environment society. Sean O'Farrell, uh, just a statement, localized government. Uh, and Larkin Lyons says, what role do you see for energy efficiency? Gavin. Thank you. Um, in response, I think, to Saif's point around measurements, um, I was wondering if you had taken into consideration David McCurry's paper from 2011, Sustainability Without All the Hot Air. I think one of the really interesting insights from that paper was a calculation that he made, which estimated the UK per capita. And I don't like using per capita because it's such a bland number. It doesn't allow for the, the differences in wealth, um, which could be up to 700%, in, in my opinion, between the richest 5% and the, the poorest 5%. But it was calculated in the UK per capita energy use is 125 kilowatt hours per person per day. So I think that's a really interesting number to kind of work from. That is our energy use. Um, and if we're talking about this um, demand size management, you know, what is an acceptable number? below 125 kilowatt hours per person per day. I mean, a question like that is at least, I think because carbon is such a, a, an abstract figure, it's such a, an, it's an invisible gas, we can't smell it, we can't see it. It's a very difficult thing to relate to. The kilowatt hour actually is a very valuable tool. 125 kilowatt hours is like leaving 125 40 watt light bulbs on 24 hours a day. So, you know, you could just imagine that you can see it and can relate to, but, do you have a sense as to what is the number we should be aiming to as per kilowatt hour per person per day? I mean, and I didn't, I didn't notice the word kilowatt hour in the report at all. So I thought that was good. Okay, before I hand back to the greenhouse, just check in if anybody else wants to make a statement, ask a question. Eric, do you want to come up? Eric Conroy from the uh, Green Party. I just want to raise the word degrowth. Um, it seems to be a word we don't use very much. Sai so used it. Uh, we tried to get a, a policy in the Green Party where degrowth, which just wasn't acceptable. Um, the two guys mentioned economic growth. I was wondering about that. There wasn't a reference to degrowth. But certainly, if we're to re reduce uh, energy, energy consumption, it must mean uh, degrowth. So we need to move to a degrowth situation. Also, Orla mentioned about working a four-day week. But when people talk about a four-day week, they never talk about, well, we need to reduce the income of a four-day week. Uh, it shouldn't just be about a four-day week for the same five-day salary. We should be reducing our income. People don't want to hear that, but to me, that's what degrowth is about. It's all the adding of all the economic activity, including all our salaries. So we need to reduce our own personal salaries. Obviously, we need to pay for housing, but um, so we need to get degrowth out there. So I'm glad it's been raised here today. Thank you. Okay, there's a few more questions. Uh, uh, Megan Carmody um, from Coalition 2030. It strikes me that we're using a number of different languages to talk about this issue. There's degrowth, of course, but there's also the well-being index, which NESC is looking at. Donut economics, Orla mentioned that, uh, which is increasingly do, um, uh, doing downscale to city and business level. Uh, the, the municipalities like Amsterdam are now using the Kate Raworth framework to look at the, the city's development into the future. Um, the SDGs, which I know have SDG 8, uh, decent work and economic growth, 
Um, although in the recent National Implementation Plan, that's the Sustainable Development Goals National Implementation Plan, um, it is noted that looking beyond just economic growth is important. And I note that 11 ministers, including the three party leaders, launched this plan. That was just, I think, last week. And last week, the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales gave a talk about the um, uh, talk about the Future Generations Act. How do the speakers suggest the above are integrated for policy coherence? As an aside, this weekend, an eco festival in the Irish Museum of Modern Art, workshops and donut economics took place. They were extremely popular. Um, thank you. So uh, that was uh, Megan Carmody. Uh, Anthony Joseph Borgen, EU ministers in September agreed on new emergency measures to tackle the energy crisis, including a mandatory target to reduce electricity consumption by only 5% of peak hours. Is it true to say that the EU level policymakers have not yet embraced demand reduction despite geopolitical situation, instead preferring a shift to alternative fossil fuels like LNG? Nick Armstrong, how do we counter the techno optimists, the eco modernist analysis that climate change can be solved by much more low zero carbon technologies? This will appear much more acceptable to the public than reduced wealth and redistribution. That was Nick Armstrong, and he's also Nick as well. How do we counter the tech? Oh, it's the same one. So just checking before I hand back to Jonathan Peter, any other comments, reflections in the room? Okay, Jonathan, Peter, back to you for your reflections on the reflections. Thank you very much for those very interesting selection of points. So I'm, I'm going to try and pick off some of them and make some points in response to them, and then Jonathan's going to come in with some extra points. So um, there was a point about needing to talk in terms of numbers and quantify things. I think that's absolutely correct. We do need to move from the, you know, so this is the direction, so therefore how, you know, how much, and so we talk in the uh, report around, well, what would sufficient reduction look like? What, what sort of rate, you know, Maybe it's not worth getting heads up over whether it's six percent or seven percent or twenty percent or twenty-one percent. But you know the scale of change required and getting some feel of the scale of change is really important. Um, so, for instance, one you know just two numbers that might be of interest from the numbers point of view. The IPPCC reckon that just from doing behaviour change, trying to nudge people to make different choices, you can get about five percent reduction in energy. Whereas if you take the full sort of um, changing systems provision, changing social practices uh, approach, then you can potentially get reduced energy by up to 70%. So there is, you know, by taking that bigger view, there is a huge scope to reduce en energy demand for rethinking development. Um, uh, so uh, jumping around a little bit, um, uh, so there's definitely a need for political leadership. I think the point on leading, uh, you know, we've got to start having these conversations that requires people to start, you know, broaching these conversations and people with political platforms to start broaching these conversations. That is really important. Um, I think we also need to talk about what we want as well as how we're going to get there. We need to, if we're going to start to get, you know, so people mentioned flourishing and, you know, you know, how do we, what about what future generations and how do we balance the intergenerational aspect of it? Um, uh, you know, we, we need, there needs to be a, a discussion. We need to have the discussion about what we want to value, you know, what really matters to us, what is well-being for all, what, which bits of you know what do we want to prioritize energy use for there's, there's some really big conversations there and we do need to start having those conversations and deciding in communities in societies in cultures what you know what matters to to us um interesting point about sunset clauses that was um you know emergency governance by definition is temporary you know if you're going to suspend current governance and say for, for this period we're going to have an emergency thing that by definition needs to have some sort of end on it and it, People can't, you know, it's very difficult to expect everyone to sort of suspend um, for a long period of time. So there's a there's a tension there because we are it's going to take years to do, you know, compared to the pandemic, responding to some of this is going to take longer. So how do you balance that? That's definitely an interesting tension. Um, uh, when it was come, the points were raised around um, governance reform, in fact, you know, we do have systems to do some of these stuff, and we've, you know, we've proved that, you know, some countries better than others. Um, have proved that they have got structures in place to respond to different sorts of emergencies. Um, uh, and that, you know, there's clearly more work being done to, to, to work out what some of these systems would look like. Um, and I'd be really fascinated to see some of these papers on, um, you know, learning some of the lessons from emergency responses to the pandemic. But 
my reflection, at least from the UK, is that there's a there's a lack of coherent talked about proposals for governance reform. You know, there's talk about tweaking around the edge. Well, we don't want to have, you know, in 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 England, it's about you are not changing the voting system, but you know, there's proposals for tweaks. There's, you know, uh, campaign groups coming out and saying we want to sit in assembly, but actually, you know, coherent proposals for how we could overhaul governance and what bits of what we've got at the moment are really useful and we want to keep and what bits we need to add on and there, there's a lack of that conversation it's not very well established i would say um so and that comes back to this point about bold ideas you know until someone has laid out well i think the way to deliver you know universal basic services to you know universal engine allowance looks like this then people can't disagree with it until there's a, a comprehensive proposal on the table um so for instance i uh, was looking at advertising um, in another piece of work recently and you know there's lots of proposals where we could restrict advertising for around children or we could restrict, we've already restricted advertising around smoking maybe we should restrict our advertising for high carbon products but there was no one who sort of gone let's step back and what's a comprehensive proposal so there's a report that greenhouse published um uh, a few years ago about what would a comprehensive reform of advertising look like you know you know if you did the whole thing and i think there's that need to be bold the need to you know how do we get away from incremental change? Well, we stop going, well, we got this, let's see if we can make it a little bit better. We've got to step back and go, well, hang on a minute, we've got all, you know, there's all this stuff. Maybe we need to look at what the step change is, and that requires that bit of distance, that bit of stepping back. Right, last few different bits. Um, shift from economy to ecology, I think that links to another point in terms, um, Jonathan, I think, is going to pick up on the point about degrowth and what language you want to use, but... Um, we need to talk about what we want and we need to talk about what we think matters and if we spend all our time talking about the economy and whether you know we have this amount of economic growth or that amount of economic growth and we talk about the economics of it all the time then we give the overall impression and the, and the overall narrative that it's the amount of money and economics that's what really matters whereas if we talk about the things that really matter then we might shift that overall balance and some of this starts to link into work around values which i won't go into um I'll just someone mentioned something that just led me to think we the precautionary principle is really you know really needs to come out at this point so the the idea of making that choice between the status quo and choosing disruption choosing redistribution and choosing to rethink energy mine is effectively choosing the precautionary approach you know you know we could bet on future te technologies to come along and you know, save us we could bet on us to de develop some new way of doing it or we could take the precautionary approach and go let's reduce energy demand to what we know we can deliver with renewable energy now um so there is a you know it's almost the safe bet um i think i will leave it there um oh the only other last, last thing i'll say um which links to the point about invested interests is incumbent industries change creates opportunities there were some business models that um that will, that will some business models will change and we we need to stop thinking about it all aggregated together as growth or not growth we need to start thinking well you know we're going to have a different economy and there's going to be some bits that are bigger and some bits that are less and we can't allow the incumbent industries who've got a good little deal and we'd quite like to keep it to allow us you know to to stop us reconsidering what matters to everyone as a whole we have to restrict the political influence of incumbent industries because the, the, the industries that will benefit don't have the same financial resources that the ones that are currently incumbents do. Um, Jonathan. Thank you. I just want to try and pick up on a few different points. Hopefully, apologies for any overlaps. Firstly, um, Brenda, you talked about elephants. Um, as Greens, I think it's always good to talk about elephants, um, but I think your elephants were around personal freedom. I would add in, I think population growth was mentioned as another elephant we don't really talk about much. Uh, and then about the, the war and, and freedom, freedom in terms of what happens in terms of security internationally. I think we do need to talk about international stuff. The whole climate framing of, of COP, the conference of parties that happens each year, is about territorial emissions. So I think you said war was 47th country globally. Well, I would add in aviation and shipping internationally, which I think rank is something like six and 10 or 11. Um, also completely omitted from most UK government policies, most Irish government policies, because we as governments are not required to do anything. We haven't agreed to do anything internationally. We've left that as voluntary frameworks for other people to address. So yes, I think we do need to talk about that. We need to integrate it. Um, I, th I think to focus on the global uh, or international government systems is a, is a whole another area of work, um, but a very important one. Uh, in terms of the, the, the questions of, of numbers and David Mackay, um, 125 kilowatt hours per day. I wonder if that includes the embodied energy of imports or not, because I think that's quite 
significance and important con to consider in Western countries how much of our energy use is that that's effectively borrowed from other other countries uh, a carbon and, and energy uh, use. I mean, the, the numbers that we looked at were two. Firstly, uh, Julian Allwood leads a research program based out of Cambridge University called UK Fires. Uh, they looked at the rate in which you could feasibly deliver renewable energy installations till 2050, um, the likelihood of um, carbon capture and storage and other um, uh, fanciful technologies being mainstreamed and economically viable by that date, and therefore, you know, how much energy budget we would have by then and compared it to how much energy we would need to be provided by renewables if it was 100% renewable in econ economy. And they said, basically, we need to cut. We need to cut by at least 40%. So 40% off your 125 as the start of a 10. If you think, though, go look at other work. So um, Tim Jackson, professor of uh, economics, um, very much focusing on, on, on post-growth um, at University of Surrey, um, said, well, what do we need to do to get to zero carbon? How quickly do we need to get to zero carbon? His paper, look it up, is called Zero Carbon Sooner. And he says between 2025 and 2030. And if you think the constraint on energy total is about how quickly we can install renew renewable energy capacity, then I would argue we should be looking for some something more aligning to the IPCC's estimates of a 70% reduction in total energy use onto the 125 as, as, a, as a number to aim for. Degrowth, um, why don't we talk about it a bit more? I, I would argue to talk about post-growth. We should basically frame capitalist economics, current growthist economics as passe, so rather than having a debate about which term we should use or whether it's good or not, just like climate change, let's not debate with the deniers. Let's move the debate on to how we're going to deliver what we know is necessary. So let's talk with confidence about post-capitalist thinking. Recognise that vested interests are corruption that embed capitalist growthist ideologies within the economic development strategies that exist globally, as well as within countries. Um, in terms of where degrowth fits in with this debate, I, I would pitch to you, um, in response to Orla's uh, question about how do we make sure that the, the climate, the environment, and, and the social and the justice elements are seen as mutually uh, consistent, I, I would say that what we tried to do in this, this report in terms of the rhetoric, uh, I think, question, was to sketch out a link between climate and justice. And I would say between the words climate and justice, consider three extra words, energy, and then degrowth or post-growth, pick which one you like, and then redistribution. So Climate emergency means we need to reduce energy use. Accepting the causal link between energy use and the size of the economy, that's going to stagnate, to degrow, or accept that growthist economics is, is now passe. That means that the only way we deal with the inequality within society that exists and is growing is to have redistribution, and then redistribution delivers you the justice. That's, the, if you like, the narrative pitch that underlies this report. Um, Eamon, it'd be great to follow up on in, infodemics and greenwashing. I think that's that's an area where we really need to do more on. Um, when we researched this, re this report, we really tried to find some good examples of what climate emergency governance looks like today. And it feels like that's an area where a lot more research, a lot more lesson learning, a lot more sharing um, is required. Um, finally, um, I, th I think a few comments back from, uh, I think, Shive's comments. Um, yeah, I think we need to transform representative democracy. And that's what a whole piece around sort of vested interests and uh, reform is needed. But at the same time, I think we need to strengthen the missing bit of democracy, which is the bottom up, the deliberative democracy, not to su suggest that it in any way replaces that, but we need to balance the top down with the bottom up. And that's also reflected in, in our policy uh, uh, research. So on the one hand, we've got people who've researched the idea of systems of provisioning and replacing the idea that the systems of infrastructure we have lock in forever more dependence on what we have already about locking in business as usual, locking energy, energy use, locking carbon emissions. We need to have different systems of provisioning, but we also need from the bottom up to have different daily practices, different norm, norms of culture. So, so I think rather than thinking of this as sort of individual behavior change, this is about um, making that a culture change, making a collective of individuals. So all of us change our individual behavior um, together. I think the distinction between the 5% the and the 70% is a distinction between a nudge on those who are likely and wanting to respond on their own 
to about all of us responding together. And, and then in terms of how we put degrowth into practice in policy terms, I'm, I would only give one example, which is my experience um, in conservative led Surrey. Um, we went through a process of declaring a climate emergency. We, we decided and chose, chose to have a university to, to give us the, the rate of fair reduction, the curve, if you like, of getting to zero carbon that we need to stay within, which is the pathway that the council is working to. We got avoid shift improved to be embedded within their climate emergency strategy. And then they accepted that 40% or 41% of the emissions in Surrey are the responsibilities of road transport for which they are the highway authority. So they said, okay, well, if avoid shift improve is the framework in our climate emergency strategy, that should govern our transport strategy. And the government requires every local council this year, pretty much in, in the UK to update its local transport policy. So we now have a hierarchy in, in Surrey, which has reversed the car plus a bit on the extra for others to, first of all, you need to remove the need to travel and that al allows you to do the walking and cycling. Then we need to upscale our investment in, uh, in, in bus travel, particularly as well as decarbonizing buses and trains before we look at cars. That's now starting to impact things like a junction improvement modeling. So the transport modeling is now claiming that it can and should uh, model bus traffic through a junction before the number of cars. So we can now argue the case policy-wise for priority bus lanes to go in all, all the main high routes. Now, where that's been done in Brighton, um, not green-led, but often green-assisted or, or, or green influence, but currently now green-led Brighton, the, the, le the num amount of priority bus routes in Brighton has led to a doubling of bus routes, a doubling, doubling of, of bus, bus patronage. So I think that, yes, we can put degrowth into policies at a national and a local level. It's more than just a, an economic band phrase. There are things that sit underneath them. And I think this report hopefully starts to sketch out what some of those may be. But I think it's it's worth just fi finally just emphasizing the need for governance change as well as the policies themselves. Thank you. So thank you, Jonathan and Peter. Um, I would say that we've uh, launched in Ireland the rethinking energy demand is uh, going to open up a lot more questions. We're going to go for a break now for 20 minutes. Online participants were back at four o'clock. Uh, we have John Gibbons, we've got Minister Oshin Smith, uh, and we've got a panel uh, that Michael Smith will be introducing. So the objective of this uh, networking break is to get to know some people you don't get to know, maybe find some synergies between sectors and the, the coffees and teas we served through this door here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. How are you doing? How are you? This is my task here. Oh, okay. 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 I'm just going to turn it off. Oh. Right, right. Thank you.